We've been in this series that we kicked off last week called Shine, Being a Light Right Where You Are. And the premise of this series is based on this verse that Jesus communicated to us about letting your light shine. And what that means is basically allowing what God has done first in our hearts to really emanate to the people around us. And we've been looking and we started this series by looking at the book of Daniel because how many of us know that it's a little difficult sometimes to shine a light in a culture that can be so dark? And uh, what we're looking at this, in this series is how do we do that? How do we practically allow what God has first done in our heart to become real to the people around us. And we now are living in, living in a culture and a society where uh, as Christians, we don't have home field advantage, meaning this, we're not living in a culture that has this understanding that God is the foundation of this culture. We've seen over years how, even though we started as a, cult, a country based on God's word, we've just seen the drift over years on how now we're living in a society where being a Christian is not the popular thing. It's not the most popular opinion, but we can still allow our light to shine. In fact, the, um, God is challenging us that the darker the world it gets, the darker the world gets, actually the brighter our light has the opportunity to shine. And so we're going to look at, we've been looking at the book of Daniel and how we do that. How do we practically let our light shine in a culture that can seem so dark? And so last week we started this series by looking at Daniel. So Daniel and his three friends, uh, God's people were taken over by the Babylonians. We talked about last week. And then there were exiled or removed to a new land. And in the process of being moved to a new land, uh, the king wanted to utilize some of the best of God's people. And so he, uh, he sent people out to look for the, the most handsomest, the smartest, and to recruit them, recruit them into leadership. And so the four that got recruited was Daniel and his three friends. And they got recruited into leadership. And so for three years now, they were just indoctrinated in just everything Babylon. And so now in this process of just learning things about a new culture, there's a collision that happens. There's, a, uh, there's culture telling them to live and do things, and they also had a conviction of how we live for God. And so last week we talked about when that happens, when there's a, a collision between our conviction and the culture, how do we respond? And the best way that we can respond is oftentimes by making decisions beforehand that will help us to continue to honor God, even in compromising situation. And so this, this evening, we're going to continue in the book of Daniel. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 2. And so like last week, we, uh, we found out that Daniel then re they resolved not to eat the, the king's food because it was sacrificed to idols. And uh, because they did that and they honored God, uh, God actually made them look 10 times better. They just ate vegetables for 10 days and ended up looking way better, looked more, more, more swole, more handsome than everybody else. And then God promoted them into a place of leadership. So now in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, we're going to pick up the story here. And in verse 1, it says this. One night during the second year of his reign, King Nebuchadnezzar had such a disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood there before the king, he said, I have a dream, not like Martin, but I had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. And so the king has these crazy dreams that's bothering him to the point where he wants to get some answers. And I looked up really some of the dreams and their possibilities. How many of us dream? You sleepy dream? How many of us remember our dreams, like the next day? All right, a lot of us. And so I looked up some of just, just dreams and their possible meanings. How many of us have ever dreamt that you were falling before? Had that dream that you're falling? And then you wake up, you're kicking things because you felt like you hit the ground? Had that before. But if you've ever dreamed that you're falling, this often symbolizes that there's something in your life that's out of control and that concerns you. So that's what the possible meaning of that dream could be. That there's something in your life that's really out of control and that's manifesting itself in your dream. How many of us have ever dreamed that you forgot a test? You forgot a test, how many of us have ever done that? If you've ever dreamed that you forgot a test, this symbolizes that you're not adequately prepared for something in your life, that there's some anxiety, you feel like you're not prepared for something, and so that's what the dream can possibly mean. If you've ever dreamed that you were stuck, uh, you ever stuck, you felt like you're stuck, you couldn't get out of it, you're like trapped in a situation, oftentimes the meaning of that is that you're simply just overwhelmed, you don't know what to do. And how many of us have ever dreamt that you had to go to the bathroom? You used, used the bathroom before? How many of us ever dreamt that? Let me tell you that, that's not a dream. That's your body telling you, get up and go to the bathroom. Because if you don't, there's going to be a mess and you're going to have to clean that up. But the dream, so the, the king had this crazy dream. He couldn't, he couldn't figure it out. And uh, basically, it was so confusing to him that he, wanted the, he was asking people to do two things. They first needed to tell him what his dream meant. 
but then he also wanted him to actually describe what his dream was. And I can understand that if you tell me the dream and I can help interpret that dream for you, that's realistic. But he wanted to do something unrealistic. He was asking them to not only just tell me what my dream meant, describe to me what I dreamt. So he's basically telling them that, like, I'm not going to tell you what I dreamed, but I dreamed something. Tell me what I dreamed, and then explain to me what I dreamed. And how many of us know that's kind of a ridiculous response? Like, I can help you figure out your dream, but you got to tell me what your dream was. And so he, was, he kind of just gives you an insight to how crazy he was. And so as a leader, he's really concerned about this dream, and now he's challenging people to tell him his dream and then to interpret this dream. Pick up the story in verse 10. The astrologers, uh, the people that he asked to do this, replied to him and said this, No one on earth can tell the king his dream, and no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. The king's demand is what? It's impossible. It's ridiculous. What you're asking us to do is ridiculous. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among people. Verse 12, the king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be what? Executed. So he, just because they couldn't do this, now he's sending out a death notice that every single person who can't do this now is going to die. We pick up the uh, story in verse 13. And because of this decree, men were sent out to find and kill Daniel and his friends. So the king is crazy. He's asking people to do something ridiculous. They say that it's impossible for them to do. And now Daniel's life is at risk. Not only Daniel's life, but Daniel and his three friends. Their life is, is at risk. And how do you respond in a situation where your life is at risk? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where your, your life is at risk. Last week we looked at how they needed to create standards to continue to honor God in the midst of compromise. But now their life was at risk and at stake. And so we're going to look at four things from this story and how we can respond in situations in life to apply this truth to our lives. First point in your notes is this. We need to rally others to pray with you or rally others to pray with us. In verse 17, the story says this. Then Daniel went home and told his friends. So this is exactly what he found out. The king says, I'm going to kill everybody. He, he was on that list and his three friends. And this is exactly what he did. He went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. And then he urged them to do what? To ask God of heaven to show him, them his great mercy by telling them the secret so that they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. And so basically he was saying this, man. His first response in this situation was... We got to pray. And not only I do I have to pray, I got to get people to pray with me. And so they prayed, prayed, prayed. And that night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. So Daniel's life was at risk. And the first thing that came to his mind was what? Prayer. Prayer. And if you're new here and you're thinking what prayer is, prayer is simply just having a conversation with God. And some of us can, might think that that's weird, like it sounds like you're talking to yourself. But if we understand that God is always around us, and actually that God's spirit is in us when we have a relationship with him, then it's not so bad. And so when we're talking about prayer, it's just simply having a conversation with God as if you would with a friend. And so when it, talking about prayer, prayer was their first response for Daniel. Prayer was their first response in the situation, especially when your life is at risk. And I looked up three reasons why we don't pray, because how many of us... If you were asking a group, what is an area that you need to grow in? M many of us would say, I got to pray more or I got to read the Bible more, which frustrates me when people sh share that in group. But that's actually one of the uh, 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 things that people believe. And so there's, here's three reasons why we don't pray as often as we should or as much as we'd like. The first thing is this. We don't think we have time for prayer. We don't think we have time. In fact, we do have time. If we found prayer to be valuable, we make time for things that are valuable to us. So oftentimes we think, man, I just don't have time for prayer. We do. We have so much time. Uh, number two, we don't think that it's important. We don't think that prayer is important. And the reason why prayer is important is because God is important. And if, you wanna, if God is important to us, the main way that we have a conversation with God is through prayer. And so if we see that God is an important thing in our life, when we're praying, we're communicating with him, we're connecting with him. And if he's important, then prayer will become important to us. And number three, we don't believe that it makes a difference. A lot of times, the reason why many of us don't pray, we feel like anything happens when we pray. And in reality, something always happens when we pray. God is always up to something. Anytime we pray in faith, God always hears our prayers. He doesn't always respond in ways that we would like him to respond. But there's no prayer that we offer up to God that goes on deaf ears. 
You ever had a person that you're talking to and they're not paying attention to you like some of us are doing right now? I'm just kidding. You ever been in a situation where you're talking to someone and they're not listening to you at all? You're like, man, are you hearing me at all? God is never like that. Anytime we're talking to him, he's always listening to us. He's always hearing our prayer. And here's the crazy thing about God. If we're all talking to him at once at the same time, he can hear all of our prayers. That's how amazing God is. He's not tuning into who he wants to listen to. He's listening to everyone at the same time. That's how amazing our God is. And so if we're honest with ourselves, oftentimes the only time prayer becomes important to us is if we're in a situation that's out of our control. How many of us have ever been there before? Like the only time you're really thinking about God is when you're in a situation that's way out of your control and now you're forced to pray because you don't have any other option. How many of us know that prayer shouldn't be our last resort? It should always be our first priority. But as a preacher, let me tell you this. I'm a pastor and a preacher. Can I just be honest? Prayer isn't always my first go-to when things happen in life. You know what my first go-to is? Try to figure it out on your own. How many of us have been there? Like, you're a control freak. All right, I'm in this situation right now. I should pray, but you know what? Let's put that on the side. Let me try and figure this thing out on my own. And so we're stressing ourselves out in the entire process, trying to figure things out. And once we get to a point where we're so frustrated now, okay, God, help me, because I don't know what to do right now. And then the funny thing about that, if, it's, if we're having a relationship with God and God sees everything that we're going to as important, then he should be our first response. Because God is a helper to us, and he not only wants to help our situation, but he actually wants to be actively involved in everything that we go to. And the way that we invite him into our situations is through prayer. And so Daniel, now his life is at risk, but you're going to find out through the book of Daniel that he didn't only pray when things got difficult, he was actually praying as a lifestyle. That was just something that he did on the regular. And then when life got difficult, he already established a pattern of prayer that he just went to his goal to. And so for us as the people of God, we need to not only pray, but we need to invite other people. And if you're here tonight and going through a situation by yourself, let me tell you that you should never be in a situation by yourself. God never calls us to do life on our own. He always calls us to do life in community with other people. And that's the main reasons that why we do group here. So we don't want people to have to figure things out on their own. We want people to figure things out in community with other people because there's strength in numbers, and when we invite other people into our lives, we get to see God do mighty things. And so not only did we, do we pray, but when we get the prayers of other people, we multiply people, and we get multiplied power. Because when we invite others, God just sometimes shows up in a powerful way. And so if you're here tonight, and you're not yet in a group, the best place for you to get prayer is in group. You know, oftentimes people come to pastors thinking that we have this special connection to God that, you know, I'm going to get the pastor to pray for me. And let me tell you, I don't have a better connection to God than any of us here. The only person that I know that has a better connection to God on staff is Pastor Camille. If you want something to immediately get answered, go to her. She'll pray for your situation. God will show up. You ask me to pray for your situation, God may or may not answer. Let me just be real. Pastor Paris, no, I'm just kidding. I was going to say, he definitely not. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but, you know, oftentimes we think that a pastor's prayer is more powerful. Let me tell you, the, the, the most powerful prayer is not a pastor's prayer. It's the prayers of people who you're doing life with. You know why? Because now they're actively involved in your life. And there's just more of a connection there. And so now they're, it's not like this drive-by prayer. Now like they're emotionally involved because they're doing life with you. And so now their prayer is a little bit more focused because you're just not a person anymore. You're someone that I'm walking with. And so the connection of prayer is a lot more powerful than, than a pastor than anybody else because why? The relationship determines the power of the prayer. The more invested you are in someone, the more you're going to give your all in prayer. And so if you're not involved in a group, I want to like, encourage you, get into group. If that's the, not the only thing that you're going to get from group, but if, the, if you needed a reason why to get into group, let me just tell you, prayer in group always happens. And when you invite other people to participate in what God's doing in your life, God shows up in a powerful way. And so God showed up in their situation. He answered their prayer. Check that. God gave Daniel a revelation of exactly what the king dreamt. Give him a picture of what the king dreamt in his prayer. And so point two in your notes is this. We need to acknowledge and embrace his sovereignty. So not only did Daniel get the answer to his prayer now, as soon as he got the answer to his prayer, here's the first thing that he did. He gave acknowledgement to God for the answer of prayer. 
he gave the acknowledgement to God for the, acknowledge, uh, for the answer of prayer. Daniel 2.20 says this. This is the first thing that happened after God revealed the answer to the king's prayer. He says this. This is his prayer. Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He, con- uh, he removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies ahead or oh, lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. The first thing that Daniel did is just acknowledge God for the answer of prayer. Like, God, it was you. You're in control. And he's basically giving God props in his prayer. So oftentimes we think prayer is just asking God for stuff. Prayer is also just glorifying God for who he is. That even though he didn't answer your situation, that doesn't change who he is. And so what Daniel was doing here is basically acknowledging God's characteristic in nature. He's saying, man, God, you're awesome. You're in control. Even though it looks like the king's in control, we know that you supersede the king and that you've actually put him in that place. And so I'm going to give you the glory and the honor that you deserve because all wisdom and everything comes from your hand. And I don't know if you've ever had this thought before. Now, if God is sovereign, meaning that he's in control of everything, then why do I need to pray? How many of us have ever thought that before? Like, if God is in control, he's all-knowing, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he knows the future, he knows exactly what's going to happen, then why do I need to pray? And the reason why we need to pray is simply this, because God chooses to partner with us in his mission to reach the world. This is not a religion. This is a relationship. And God wants to invite us into knowing him and the way that we know him and participate with what he's doing. The best way that we do that is through prayer. God is inviting us. Hey, this is what I'm doing. I want you to be involved in that. And how we can be practically involved is just praying, God, I want you to use me. I want you to use this person. I want you to open this door. I want you to soften this heart. I want you to do immeasurably more than what I could ever ask or imagine. We're basically praying for God to continue to do what he's already doing, and we're just participating with him in that process. And here's why that's important, because when God answers a prayer, two things will happen. We don't think that it's coincidence. We don't think, like, we're not shocked, like, wow, God did something. Wow, this thing might work, kind of works. It really is affirming that, no, this is not coincidence. I prayed and God did something. And so, God, you are real. And so we are not just living life just thinking that everything is just random events that's happening. When we pray, we can have some confidence that nothing is coincidence, that God is in control of the situation. And the second thing is this, when the answer comes, we don't think that we did it. That's why prayer is important. We don't take, take ownership or take glory for something that was never ours to begin with. It was always God. It was always God doing something, and he just invited us to be along in the process of him doing something already. We were just participating in the work that he's already done. We were just involved in his process of doing things on the earth. And when it comes to prayer, we've got to break this mentality that prayer is not manipulating God to do something. Prayer is not just telling God, if I just pray this prayer, God now is obligated and forced to answer my prayer because that's how it works. That's not how it works. That's religion. You're just forcing God to do something. If you think that it's a relationship, prayer is not manipulating God, but prayer is moving where God is moving and trusting what he's doing already. And so we're praying, and when things don't turn out the way we want it to, it's not that God didn't answer your prayer. Maybe he has something better in store. Maybe we need to just trust him. You know where the trust is truly developed? Not in answered prayer. Can we continue to trust God when he doesn't answer our prayer in our way and in our time? That's really the, the real trust. Because if God answered all of our prayers, now we just think God is a genie in a bottle. Christina Aguilera, way back in the day, but he's not. We just think that now you're obligated to do whatever I want, and now you're forced to give me what I want. But when we see that this is a relationship, now we submit our desires to him. And when things don't go the way we want it to, we can still trust that he's in control. And that's where real faith is developed. Not when your prayers get always answered. It's how do we respond when our prayers don't get answered in the way that we want or the way that we desire? Can we continue to trust God in that situation? So oftentimes people think, I don't need to pray because God is in control. If our understanding of God is that God is always in control and it forces us not to pray, then our understanding of God is off. Because if we have an understanding that God is in control, it would invite us to pray more 
because we want to be involved with what he's already doing. We want to participate. We want to not be sitting on the bench, but we want to be actively involved in what he's doing. And the best way that we do that is through prayer. That's why Romans 8.28 says this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his pur purpose. So when we trust that God is in control. He's good. We can trust that it, he's going to work things out for good, even if the situation doesn't appear to be good on the surface. We can trust that, hey, God, you're still in control. I can still trust you. I'm going to still pray. And oftentimes we get mad at God when he doesn't respond in the way that we want. And that just reveals to us that we have maybe a wrong view of God. That he's not just a genie in a bottle, but he's a God that we need to submit to and trust that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So God reveals himself to Daniel, shows up, gives him the answer to the prayer, and here's what happens next. We need to humbly point to God. Third point in your notes. Humbly point to God. So Daniel gets the dream. God reveals to him the dream of the king. Now remember, this is what everybody else says, that that's impossible to do. But how many of us know what's impossible for man is what? Very possible with God. So they said no one can do that. And Daniel prayed and God did the impossible because impossible situations where, is where God likes to show up the most in. Impossible situations. So he shows up, gives Daniel the vision, and here's what Daniel does. So the king said to Daniel, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Daniel replied, this is his reply. There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can what? Reveal the king's secret. He's saying no one can do this. But there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. What did Daniel just do in that moment? He didn't take credit saying, yeah, I got this. I can tell you what your dream was. You know, he pointed to God as the source of everything. He said this, you know what? No one can do this. Well, let me tell you who can. There's a God in heaven. He's real. He knows you. And he's going to reveal to you what your dream was and what your dream means. And so Daniel basically use that moment to maximize God in his life. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, we can take credit and uh, not give God any credit in our lives. Have you ever been there before God shows up and we think, ah, we just don't maximize him as much as we want. We kind of take credit for things that God has done in our life. And if we find ourselves doing that, it's not that we're stealing glory from God. We're just not giving him the glory that he should be be deserved in a situation. So, so I kind of love when athletes score a touchdown and after the game they're giving props to God. How many of us have ever seen like athletes do that at the games or artists where they say, you know, first off, I just want to thank God. Uh, Tua Tango Vailoa did that. Uh, the St. Louis alumni, you got to give props. So you pointed to God and, you know, sometimes that can be cliche and actually sometimes that can actually be taken to the point where it's just too extreme. Take a look at the screen at a moment where sometimes giving God praise can be too extreme. Take a look at this. Bears point guard Ricky Jay is fielding questions following tonight's game against the Bloodhounds. How do you feel about the outcome of tonight's game? Oh, it was all God. Come on, you don't think you had anything to do with it? Uh, no, no, I can't take any credit for this one. This was truly God's doing. But you lost. Jesus is the reason for every season. I'm sorry, are you blaming God for your team losing the game? Hey, nothing against the guy. I mean, it's just, you know, you got to take the good with the bad, right? He gets the credit for the wins, ergo, he's got to get the credit for the losses. But what about the 19 points he scored for the Bloodhounds? I mean, we can sit here and make excuses all day. I accidentally scored the deciding 19 points for the other team. I accidentally gave Coach the wrong start time for the game. I spent the first half playing the floor as lava, but... Ultimately, it's up to God. Why do you think they were able to score so easily? We did everything we could. We can really only blame God. You don't think it's because you quintuple teamed one player, leaving everyone else open? Again, I'm just a vessel. I'm like a puppet. God's running the show. How did your 42 turnovers affect the outcome of the game? Only God can know for sure. Yeah, well, according to the stat sheet, it looks like the other team scored every time you turned the ball over. And still, God... In his infinite wisdom, just decided that tonight was not our night. Is there anything you could have done differently? Fasted? You're saying you might have won if you starved yourself before the game. A worker's appetite works for him, for his hunger urges him on. But in the end, it doesn't matter. It's all God. How do you regroup after such a terrible loss? I mean, we'll keep practicing. 
You know, practice makes perfect. But really, all that is worthless. It's all up to God. Money! Ouch! That was God. Next question. You. Linda Cartwheel from ChristianSports.com. Uh, God had nothing to do with the outcome of this game. When you asked the other team why they won, what did they say? God. No more questions. I just thought that was pretty funny as far as sometimes in trying to give God credit, we don't know how to do it right. And sometimes Christians, we're just awkward when someone tries to give us encouragement. We don't know how to receive encouragement. You ever went up to someone and just try to encourage them as a believer? And then they're like, you know, everything is God. I didn't do anything. You just try to give God like all of that. And it just comes off weird. So in the moment of encouragement, we can either be what? Too spiritual or we can take too much credit. And there's a balance on how to do both, you know, like because God works through us. We're a vessel that he used. And so we don't always have to be like, I didn't do anything. It was all God. It was just a partnership that God works through you to encourage people. And this is something that I needed to be learning because after service, sometimes people come up to me, hey, that was an amazing message. And I would have to feel like, no, it wasn't me. It was the Lord. You know, I didn't say anything. He spoke through me. You know what I mean? Like, it, we just got weird. I didn't know how to respond in a situation because I felt like, man, I got to give God glory, but I wasn't involved. You know, like, how do you do that right? And I just started to get weird about it, and I just had to come to a place where realizing that I'm, and this is my response now when someone says, hey, great message. I would say, you know what? Thank, I thank God that he used me to speak to you. And so it's a way to still be involved in the process, but not be weird about it. And I think when it comes to people who don't have a relationship with God, we don't know how to communicate and point people to God in a way that gives him the credit and the glory that he deserves. Sometimes as believers, people in faith, we don't know how to do that right. And I like how Daniel set the premise before he even answered the, 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 the person's dream. He basically said that no one can do this, but we serve a God that who can. And I think the way that we can be a light to the world is by always leveraging every opportunity that we have to do it in a normal way, to glorify God in a way that just doesn't come off as overly spiritual or overly churchy, but just say, hey, man, God, yeah, God gave me the wisdom to do that. Praise him. Without him, I wouldn't be able to do that. We can normalize God in our life in a way that is attractive to people who are far from God. And I love the fact that Daniel did that. He didn't take too much credit, but he also didn't take any credit at all. He found a healthy medium on how to do that right in a way that was really a revelation to the king. And in our lives, I feel like God wants to, to use us. Whatever platform we have, we might be on two extremes where we give God all the credit. I mean, we got to balance it off to see that, yeah, God used me to impact people. And then for some of us, we have a platform and we don't give God any credit. We take all the credit. We kind of point to ourselves saying, yeah, I did this and I did that, not realizing that the way that you did that is because God gave you the skills and the wisdom and the ability to do that. And so he used you in a way to impact others. And so he should be involved in our lives. And for some of us who are on that extreme where we don't give God any credit, sometimes the platform that he's given you, man, the best thing that you can do is just start acknowledging him more and more in all that you do. A guy that is in my group, uh, he works for a mortgage company. And his boss actually allows us to have group there. And his boss does these free presentations to help people to really learn more about money and finances and also purchasing home for a uh, military community. And he does a great thing. And at every single one of his presentations that he does for free, at the end, he talks about his testimony and he gives everyone a free Bible. It's just his way of leveraging that platform now to make an impact into people's lives. So he's not hiding his spirituality, but he's not also throwing it in people's faces he's just sharing with them what god has done in his life in a means that actually is attractive to people and he's told me numerous stories where people came up to him and says thank you for this i'm just so blessed that you would do that now they're seeing the reason why it's free because god is using him to be a blessing to other people so he's leveraging that platform in a way that is normal but that points people and gives god the credit for everything that he's doing in our life for some of us Maybe we need to start opening our mouths more and less talking about us and start to talking more about what God has done through our lives. And that's exactly what Daniel did. That's why 1 Peter 5 says this, God opposes the proud, but give grace to the humble. For those who understand that without God, we're nothing. That's what humility is. It's not thinking less of yourself. 
It's thinking of yourself less so that God gets the credit to, through your life. So humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. When we give God credit, we're exalting God in our situation, not exalting ourselves. We want to make God known through our life. And when God can trust us that with the platform that he's given us, we're going to give him the credit, guess what? He increases our platform. He increases our platform so we, he knows that we can be trusted in these platform moments that we're not going to minimize him, but we're actually going to maximize him in a way that gives glory to him and makes a difference in the lives of others. So Daniel did that. The first thing that he did before he even started telling the king his dream was give God the praise. So Daniel interprets the dream, tells the king what his dream was, and then interprets the dream for the king and the king now is amazed. The first thing that the king did is just throws himself down and starts worshiping God. Worshiping God. You know when we make God big in our lives, that often leads to others seeing God work through our lives. And last point in your notes is this. We need to share God's blessings with others. So King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshiped him. And he commanded his people to what? Offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. Basically, give honor to God, and that's what they did back in the day, just offered sacrifices. Uh, verse 47 says this, the king said to Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of gods, is the greatest of all gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Your God has been able to do the impossible for me. I didn't think anyone could do it, but your God did it, and now I see him for who he is. Verse 48, then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He started blessing him. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as chief over all his wise men. He started giving them more position, more platform. Verse 49, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon. So God softened the king's heart, used Daniel to communicate his truth to the king, reveal the dream, interpret the dream, and now the king is starting to praise God. And he promotes Daniel, gives Daniel a position of authority now in the land. And what the first thing that Daniel did? What's the first thing that he did? He brought the people that prayed with him along in the process. So what happened there? The blessing that Daniel received now wasn't isolated to himself, but he actually shared that blessing with other people. The people that were laboring in prayer with him in the process. He didn't just keep the blessing to himself. The first thing that he did was share the blessing with other people. He remembered where he came from. He remembered who was walking with him. And as he got promoted, he basically leveraged his position to make sure that that same blessing that he received now flow through the people around him. And you know when God blesses our lives, he doesn't want to just bless you for yourself. He wants to bless you more than enough. So why? So that you can be a blessing to the people around you. Because God wants us to be a vessel for his blessing to flow through. In order for the blessing to flow through, it needs to first flow in. But it doesn't stay in. It flows out of our lives to impacting other people. The first thing that we should do when we receive the blessing of God is not keep it to ourselves, but share it. And he shared it with like his grace group homies who are partnering with them in the process. You know when God promotes you, maybe gives you an increase in pay? The true test is not only if you're going to honor God with that, but are you going to share that blessing to other people? Like God, can God trust you to now be a blessing, a conduit of his blessing to the people around you? Can God trust you with that? Because it's one thing to be blessed. And many of us want to be blessed, but can we be blessed to be a blessing? Can we be trusted that whatever God gives our way, we're not only going to give it back to him, but we're going to share it with the people around us. And that's really the true test in our lives. God usually pours into us so that we can pour out into other people. As we come to a close and as the worship, the keyboard comes up. Um, LeBron James has been in the news lately. And uh, I'm, I'm a LeBron James fan. I've already jumped on the Laker bandwagon, signed my form, so don't judge me. Um, but the one thing that he did before he left Akron, as he is now a Laker, is he opened up this I Promise school. How many of us have ever heard about that school? He's been in the news. And uh, he started a school that's a public school, but it's a free public school now, that's going to be 
free books, free tuition, free meals. He's basically covering all the costs that they would need for them to have an education. And the reason why he did this school is because he was an at-risk student himself in the fourth grade. Him and his mom were really poor, and they were homeless at some times. And so for a period in his fourth grade year, he missed 83 days of school because they were just bouncing from house to house. And because of that moment that he experienced, and that brokenness in his life, he had some mentors come in that helped him get back on track. But that moment and that hurt never left him. And when he made it to the NBA and got his contracts and so forth, he always had a dream that I was gonna, he's going to start a school. He's going to give back to the community that he came from. And years later now, he's now in a position of platform. He now has a lot of influence. And he's now leveraging that influence to now make a difference in the lives of other people. And so he started this school. And the reason why he's doing this now is because he wants the kids not to experience what he had to go through. And so the, 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 the students that are now open to this school are those who are at risk as well, who are having difficulties financially, and he wants to invest in them first and foremost. Here's the best thing about this school. If they graduate with honors, he promises to them that he's going to pay for their tuition to go to the University of Akron. So he's taking it up on that. He's really not putting his money where his mouth is, not just taking the wealth for himself, but he's in actively investing that into the next generation. Some of us here, you've been blessed so much by God. You don't know what to do with that blessing, and God is now challenging you. Can you be a blessing to other people? Can you invest in the lives of others? Can you now not just enjoy the blessing for yourself? Now, can you actively invest sacrificially into the betterment of other people? Daniel didn't forget where he came from. LeBron didn't forget where he came from. They now use that platform to influence others. And sometimes God puts us in a position of influence and he wants us to do the same. And all of us in some way, shape, or form can do that. You might not have all the money in the world, but you can do something. We can be a blessing to other people. You can do small things here and there to make sure that the blessing that God fills you first with flows through you to impact other people. It might just start with you treating someone for a meal blessing someone with something. You know, just starting small. But for some of us, you have some positions of influence. You now are financially well off. God wants to challenge you to leave a legacy behind that your investment will last for years to come. And so Daniel, in this moment, we're learning from him. He first rallied others in prayer. He acknowledged God in his situation. Not only that, he pointed to God and what he was going through, and he shared his blessings with other people. And for us in our lives, oftentimes we can get so consumed with what we're facing that we can only see us. And oftentimes the way that you can get beyond yourself is just to sometimes take your eyes off yourself and realize that there's always someone around you that's going through something a lot more difficult than you. And not that it minimizes what you're going through, but it puts everything into perspective. You might be here tonight, you're going through some tough stuff. Not going to minimize what you're going through, but I want to encourage you that there's somebody else around you that's going through worse and that God can use you to encourage them, to be a blessing to them so that they can see God flow through your life in a powerful way. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for this word. Lord, we thank you for the example that you've given to us with Daniel and his friends. Lord, their lives were at risk and they were able to still honor you in a way that made you known in their place. It made you known to the king. And God, help us to see that there's always people around us that are watching us and wants to see how we respond in these critical moments, God. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness if we haven't maybe responded in a way that pointed, points people to you. God, forgive us if we took, have taken too much glory for ourselves. Forgive us where we haven't let the blessings flow through our lives to other people. God, forgive us where we just got so consumed with ourselves. And instead of making a platform for you, we're just building our own platform for ourselves. And so this evening, God, we ask that you would forgive our hearts and Lord, refocus us back to really what's important. At the end of the day, God, it's all about you. You're in control. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, we just want to participate in what you're doing. And in a world that's going so selfish and dark, God, we pray that we would go counterculture to that and live a life that makes a difference. 
a life that lives beyond ourselves, that's concerned with not just what we're going through, but with what's happening around us. God, fill us with empathy and compassion for those around us in our lives. And God, we ask that you would use us in a powerful way to shine the light that's already in us, but do it in a powerful way that points people to you so that they can see you through our lives. With heads still bowed and eyes closed, if you're here tonight and God has maybe been challenging you in one of these topics of maybe a topic of prayer or maybe a topic of trying to do life on your own or maybe just getting challenged with the platform that he's given you, maybe having given God the glory or maybe even just challenged in the area of being a blessing to others. If God has been speaking to you something, I want to invite you to raise your hand. I want to pray for us that God would help us to do what he's challenging us to do. Hands going up, hands going up, my hands up. God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. And Lord, we thank you that not only do you hear prayers, but Lord, you answer prayers. And Lord, we thank you that you love us enough to speak to our hearts on areas that we need to adjust. Maybe areas where we have gotten self-centered and we need to be more God-centered. Areas where we've gotten more about ourselves and we forgot about you. God, we pray that we would make the, the necessary adjustments first in our hearts. And what you're doing first in us, God, we pray that you would now flow through us in a powerful way. So, Lord, not only do we want to be hearers of what you're telling us to do, Lord, we pray for the courage and the boldness now, to now walk out what you're practically speaking to our hearts to do in this moment. God, whatever it is, that next step of obedience, God, we pray that we would have the courage to sustain what you're telling us to do in this moment. That it won't just go in one ear and out the other, but Lord, we will be doers of your word, walking in obedience so that you can get the glory through our lives. We thank you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.